everywhere else in the world that has tourism, you know, America or Canada or, you know, even the smallest town has a little museum and it brings tourism. Here you've got, you know, thousands of years of, the Romans were here, the Greeks were here, and none of it's told. Did you do? do here. Hey, no. did you do an audio an audio, audio version of this? No. Would you do it? Yeah. I think that would sell very well. Okay. So for me personally, I don't read anymore yeah, because I don't have fucking time. Yeah. So what I do is I I buy the Amazon Audibles audios and like if I'm on the motorbike or if I'm working or if I'm going to the gym. Yeah. Way easier to get through a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I I just been that busy with um. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do it when split the profit or whatever. Maybe we could, Hans, maybe we could do that. Because we have all the equipment for him to read this thing, right? I'm guessing this would take you how many hours? Uh, I'm going to say that's probably six to eight hours. But you hammer out an hour a day. Yeah. No, no, I have no problem reading through it. Yeah. No, that'd be really cool. This here. Okay, welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan. And today we have a lovely guest. He's going to be telling us about the history of Phuket. We have Colin McKay. Um, how, how long have you been here, Colin? About 23 years. 23 years. Now, he's brought his book along with us. He's going to be recording an Amazon Audible, uh, like an aud Audible audio as well. Um, we'll let you know when that comes out. We, we literally just talked about that right now. Um, so we're going to jump into his story as we usually do in terms of, uh, where's Colin from? What did he, what did he do before Phuket and what drove him here and what are the next steps for him? Uh, primarily this is for, this podcast is for anyone looking to learn the history of Phuket from the, to the ancient times, 30,000 years ago. And, and we, we are aware of those cave paintings outside in Pangna Bay, right up to, uh, current day thailand and we'll use words like the current situation to avoid youtube from okay. flagging us okay. so if we ever want to say that word it's the current situation um a quick background story i actually i reached out to colin because hugo another um uh, guest introduced me and said hey i must have him on the show and then randomly we ran into each other at a crypto meeting when i called him up thanks inna thanks hugo um, so without further ado, let's get this started and shoot that over to Colin. Thanks a lot, Colin, for, for joining us today. Just tell us a little bit about your background, what you did before and what brought you to Phuket. Okay. I was, um, I'm Scottish, but I was born in Kenya. Um, I grew up in Tanzania. My dad was there with Caltex, went to study in Scotland, um, did my university. I studied history at university and you know, I grew up on a beach like here. I mean, literally, if you swim three three thousand kilometers that way, um, you land up at my house in Tanzania. Because you said you're kind of uh, nearby a Dar es Salaam, yeah? Yeah, right near yeah. Dar es Salaam. And people like you have what's the island off of the coast there? Um, it's uh, famous. Zanzibar. Right? Zanzibar. Yeah, well, the or Bagamoyo Mafia. There's a yeah, few yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, beautiful place to grow up, and um, I didn't really fancy living in Scotland, so. I left and traveled around for like two, three years. You know, I did two years between school and university. I was in adventure holidays, rubber rafting and all that stuff. And then I became a journalist. I covered um, some military stuff like the wars in Cambodia. Um, and then in Hong Kong, you suddenly realize, hold on. It's the fund managers and the brokers who've got the beautiful girls and the nice houses. So yeah, I think maybe pull the mic up a bit, right? I think that's <clears> perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So um, I moved into finance. I became a stockbroker and um, started financing little mines um, in, in Australia and Canada. Uh, mines were all around the world and did really good in a few years. So I'd made my first million within about three years of working. And, and what, what year are we at at this uh, point? We're, we're now at, well, okay, I'm, I'm 62. I was born in 1960. I arrived in Hong Kong at about 24 years old. Um, 25, 26, I was doing journalism. By 28, just turned 29. My 29th birthday, I cashed out my first million from some stock. Um, and what I'd been doing was looking at, thinking, look, geologists tell you there's gold down there. 
but historians can tell you there's gold because there's so many shipwrecks. And my dream was always to salvage shipwrecks. In which area was that? <clears throat> well, I've, I've worked in Vietnam. I okay. w- we started but in Indonesia. Primarily the, Southeast Asia. Yeah, well, no, I ended up in Dominican Republic. Okay. Caribbean's chock-a-block. We, we, have a, we had a concession in, in the north of Dominican. Um, so I did that um, until I was broke. And we got a lot of treasure, but at that time it wasn't. There was no internet. You couldn't just flog the treasure. You had to move it. Anyway, I came back. I started a fund management company in Vienna, um, taking European money and again investing it in little stocks. And we did one really good one in about five years in um, a platinum deal in in South Africa. And we've got the the share at two cents. It went eventually to twenty six dollars. I got out at you know like a dollar, but mm. I, I had millions of shares. So. That was me, done. And I was um, 38 by then. Um, and I said, right, what am I going to do? Well, I'll, I, I wanted to live on an island. I wanted to stay in Asia because I've got used to Asia. Um, so you go, is there Cebu or Bali? Bali's a bit far away. Uh, Phuket, right? And um, when I started coming down here, I saw the promise of this place. Is this in the 80s when you made this decision? Well, I know it was the 90s. 90s, 90s okay. Uh, late 90s. Because um, Phuket probably still wasn't that developed at no, this point, No, I mean, right? all this strip where we are yeah. right now, you know. Was, but what happened was that the Thai back crashed. Um, you know, it went from, I love this country at 25 back to the dollar. And suddenly it went to 58 back to the dollar. It was like twice as good, twice as cheap, twice as yeah. everything. So I just moved here. And um, I wanted to build, I bought some land on the beach. I built a nice beach house. And a load of people came along and said, oh, can you build one for us? So instead of what I wanted to do then was just write history books, you know, chilled out, had my money, travel around the world, goof off, do all my things and write history books to keep my brain going. Um, So I did that. um, But I got caught being a developer, which is a pain in the ass, right? I mean, it's nice at first you draw the houses and you, you know, plan it all out and then, then... it's a pain in the ass after that. The headache right? dealing with all the vendors. Yeah, so I built yeah. a few, quite a few developments here. And then I pulled out. We had some land issues on uh, Project Samsara. Um, and I said, right, now I'm just going to chill. Uh, I actually went off for two more years. Because we have that saying if you in Britain, if you stay somewhere more than seven years, uh, you're going to get stuck there, right? Mm. So I went off. I went around all the world, everywhere where there's... Um, you know, beautiful women, and it's cheap because I'm a bit crazy because I'm African raised. <laughs> and, um, you know, I love love Dominican Republic, love Panama, I love Paraguay, I love Tanzania, I love Kenya, I love Philippines. But at the end of the day, Phuket's got everything. I mean, yeah. you, and you're not looking over your shoulder. You can leave your mobile phone and they'll give it back to you tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the law kind of works here. So I said, right. Oh, dear, there goes my phone. Is that your phone? Yeah, That's just right. close it off. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, it's okay. The microphones, the, the microphones don't even pick that up. Yeah. So um, yeah, then I I was um, here and I started writing a novel, a historical novel, and in researching it, I was researching Asian history. Is, and now is this still referring to? No, the, no. This, this came book? out of this novel because as I was researching, I'm going, damn, a lot of history. There's like I I love to know the history of where I am. It, I just feel more of a sense of place when I'm there. And it's really hard to find any history here and certainly anything interesting. It's all, you know, long Thai prior, blah, 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 whatever, and King Rutch and Rutch, and, and you just get bored. It's very it. dry. Yeah, you completely know. dry. Yeah. So uh, uh, turgid, I think, is the word you'd use. But um, So I, I'm going, damn, there's a lot of stuff went on here. And, of course, the Thais, you know, this hasn't been Thai very long, this island. I'm, basically, it's been majority Thai since about 1950. But they want to project that it's always been part of Thailand even though Thailand just started in 1942, I think, or 39, um, it was kind of affiliated to Siam, but it was also Malaysian and Indian and the French were here and the Dutch. But was it officially part of Thailand, like a part of the country, or was there a point where it... Ah, but, okay, it... Um, I mean, that that's a long question, but it was within the kingdom of Siam and the way the old Asian kingdoms worked, where you had mandalas, where you had a king... I mean, the thing they wanted was people. There was so much land. Like, I think it was King Mongkot. He said, um, a land without a people is, is but a desert, right? So mm. even it's really fertile land, if it's full of jungle and you can't go in there, what's the point of having it if you've got no people to cultivate it? So they used to call themselves lords of men. So they really wanted to control the people because there was so much land. I mean, even the Malay Rajas, 
they wouldn't know where their land stopped, you know, to try and go into the middle of the Malay Peninsula in the jungle. The only routes through were the elephant routes. So they didn't know how big their land was. So everything was based around the coast or the rivers. Right? Yeah. Um, and all, all islands were good. So th there was a settlements here from way back, I mean, like 2000, because it had um, tin. And yes. tin was used in bronze. Yeah, right? we, have the, we have the tin, tin mines there. Now, when... Um, uh, we'll, we'll jump through that. I think we'll try to go through chron chronologically. And again, yeah, this is probably this, easier than jumping through. Yeah, this podcast would probably be seven hours if we try to go through <laughs> the book. And another thing we discussed, we might, we will, we'll probably bring Colin back again, but we'll focus more on your life story, which I think we'll have another two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you were, you started off uh, writing a history novel, which led to this book. Yeah, based so, in the Philippines in seven, which I've now uh, finished. Um, but it was while researching that that I realized how much was going on in Phuket, and I got deflected, and I thought, well, hold on. Everywhere else in the world that has tourism, you know, America or Canada or, you know, even the smallest town has a little museum and it brings tourism. Here you've got, you know, thousands of years. of The Romans were here, the Greeks were here, and none of it's told. So, I mean, the, the museums here is pretty pretty shitty. Um, the one in Phuket town? Yeah, well, the, the one in, well, all of them actually, but the one in... Um, Salang, right? The, the history museum. I mean, it's nice done, but it just needs more care. And mm. these days, museums are big business. I mean, if you bring people in and you have your cafes and your food and, um, you know, you put on interactive shows and, mm. you know, it's very turgid and stale there too. But really good stuff, you know, when the in, old Indian carvings and, but um, it's not well presented. And um, most Thais don't give a damn about the history. They don't know the history. Uh, it's barely taught at school. So, um, the Chinese who have been here for 200 years have been very good at keeping records. And some of the Chinese I work with, they know their history very well, but they only know for 200 years. I was dealing with 2,000 years, so or 3,000 years. Your book, um, and, and some of it we talked before, so I'm aware of it, but maybe this is just more for the audience. Like your book, it's going right back to the beginning on the like the geology side. Like for example, when, like I said at the start of the podcast, when you head out to Pang Na Bay, um, and there's certain caves and you go and there's cave paintings. Isn't that supposed to be like 30,000 years old? Yeah. Um, in, in Asia, the sea level has gone up and down a lot over the last million years. So Pangna Bay, you know, the big cast limestone, which is kind of all, almost looking like how long Bay to an extent. Well, it, it's all it, there were the biggest reef in the world used to run from the bottom of Sumatra all the way up to, uh, um, Guilin in the middle of China. So you can see it all the way up the peninsula. There's these cast rocks. Yes. And then you see it go through Vietnam. It goes through Sukhothai, goes through Vietnam, Halong Bay. It goes up through central China to Guilin. And it all that, looks the same. That was one big reef when those yeah. seawater. Now, what, when the water falls down, um, it's alkaline rain just dissolves um, limestone or reefs. Mm. So what you're seeing there is the last bits of a map, the biggest reef ever in the world. I mean, you know, the barrier reefs, nothing compared to... And so you get these amazing um, structures. Um, so that's Pangna Bay. And that's what we see in Rally and when we're driving. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. I mean, it goes all the way up yeah. the peninsula. You see, the, you know, Sukhothai is full everywhere. That, there's remnants of that reef. Um, so then the sea level fell down. Well, the good thing about it, the caves in there is a good place to hang out, to live. So when the black people left Africa, they came here. Right? They, 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 the first residents were here were, were, were blacks. Um, you know, the same guys who walked down to Australia and started the Aborigines. Yeah. But you got two types. You got a bigger group, kind of like Papua New Guineans. Um, and you got the smaller, they're called Negritos. Because living in the jungles, it, being smaller worked better. Right? They bred smaller, uh, you know, they don't have malaria. Uh, they just interbreed really quickly. In those days, if you had a tribe of 20 people come in um, to an area with malaria or something, um, they would just wipe out apart mm -hmm. from the four people who were immune to malaria. So when they rebred, they were immune. It was very quick to change. How did you get all this information? This must have been a nightmare. I spent five years researching. I, I, as I say, I'd made my money. I was goofing off. Where, so. where like, you're, you're able to get this information, uh, especially about the reef. Now, that's probably more... Oh, that, that's pretty easy. Easy I mean, to find. But now, where, where, where... But the more intricate, later stuff, or, or the early Thai history is very hard because no one really wrote it. They... What they used to do was was um, write on sort of papyrus paper, and they would wrap it up in banana leaves, kind of like a Vietnamese spring roll, 
and store it in little boxes. Well, that, that doesn't last very long. So all the old writing's gone. So the only sources for ancient history in this region uh, was coming from the Arabs, the Greeks, and the Chinese, because they did keep records. Mm. So it was very hard. You had to reach far and wide to find references to this part of the world. Right? Do you have any examples? Like, again, you're, you're mentioning the Chinese would have this information documented. How did you get in touch with the right people to get that well, no, information? No, they, 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 many scholars. A lot of my stuff is secondary. Um, I actually was hoping to get a PhD um, at Edinburgh University from this, but I didn't do enough primary information, uh, primary research, which I should have interviewed more of. And I regret now, I, I didn't reg um, interview more of the old Chinese guys around who were here in the Second World War. Most of them are now dead. I mean, this was 15 years ago I wrote that or started researching it. And these guys were founts of information. They all study in Penang, spoke really good English. And I'd love to go and talk to them now about stuff, but they've died, right? Yeah. So they were in their 90s. Um, so they they were very, it got a lot easier when the Europeans appeared because they keep a lot of records. And um, later Chinese kept a lot of records. And by the 19th century, the Thais were keeping reasonable records. Um, but, but early, like, you know, 12th century, 10th century, 6th century, uh, the Muslims also kept, reasonable records specifically for Phuket when was the biggest let's say civilization that really arrived here and started to cultivate and create an industry okay okay we'll just run through uh, okay so yeah quickly. maybe I jumped away just run through quickly was yeah the blacks came here um these Negritos the next group to come were the Malays and so they left South China they went the Malays had the biggest expansion in world history so they ended up crossing all of Micronesia they even got as far as Madagascar you know Malay Gassi uh, all Indonesia, and from Indonesia, they were coming up the peninsula. Um, so the other people living here at the time were the boat people, or the, the, the what are they called now? The um, Were these similar to the people that you would find at, you know, the Surin Islands? Yeah, those are the boat people. They're, okay. they're, um, and pe pe uh, not Surin Beach, Surin Islands. We're talking like north of the Similian Islands. Yeah, they're called hockey. No, what is their name? They've got a name, Chow Chu or something. Uh, Again, because the, they don't even have a Thai passport if you go out there. They're nomadic. Yeah, they live on their boats. And yeah. They go around. They, they kind of herd it into villages now. But they, they, So, look, what happened was the blacks came. Then eventually the black people turned into Mongoloids, right? Or Chinese, right? So black people ch changed in, in Iran or Aryan or Iranian. As, and they went north and basically turned white, like Arctic foxes, and like us, right? You live in Canada. Yeah. Um, the... In the ice ages that came and went, uh, other people cut off and they turned from Negroes into uh, Mongol people, uh, Mongoloids. So, you know, sledgy little eyes because it's minus 60 degrees, you don't want to free. Whereas black people have big nostrils for more airflow, black pigmentation in the sun. So the 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 guys who carried on south have stayed black. So you see um, New Guinea and Aborigines in Australia mm -hmm. and yeah, all, all the, a lot of the Pacific Islands. So... Then what happened was the Mongoloids migrated down here. They came some overland, um, uh, which became the boat people, because you couldn't really go in the jungle. The jungle was just, I mean, if you ever walked off a trail in it's the jungle, yeah, you yeah. can't go from here to that wall. <laughs> uh, it's chock a block. You know, you have tigers, you have uh, scorpions, you have snakes, you have mosquitoes, you have wild elephants, you have a lot of black panthers. Yeah. You didn't want to be in there, right? Um, ants, and you just didn't want to be in there. So they would just go around the coast and go up the rivers. So they lived on their boats um, and you could fish and you can eat seafood. And then there were other people who started settling on the rivers, riverine settlements. That's when they first came to Phuket because the Bronze Age, what is that, 6,000 years ago, bronze you need, um, is copper and tin. 6,000 years ago. Yeah, about 6,000 years ago, they first, people first started working with bronze. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that, they just had, you know, sticks and bones and, but if you got bronze, someone must have been making a fire somewhere and realized that these two metals gel together. It's very malleable, but it's a hard metal. So that's where you see the Greek civilizations coming off bronze. Suddenly you've got weapons to kill. You've got people who can, um, you can plow your fields better than using a stick, right? So everyone needed tin. Well, at that point, this island had tin all over. The tin here is in the granite, right? This is not Pangnar Bay. This was a folded granite, and the tin's in the granite. So as the mountain erodes, all the mountains here, 
the tin is heavier and it settles in, you know, Bangtan Bay over here like, is full of tin. Like right? these, but like, for example, like Red Mountain Golf Courses, that's... Yeah, that, that was that, just cho- chewing up, chewing into the mountain. Were those just, the, essentially those golf courses were just tin mines? Yeah, all, all, all golf courses here because you, they used to use uh, floating dredges. So they would leave uh, big lakes where they were digging. They, they, dig, they used the water for cleansing it. Yeah. So they just trunch it up. I mean, dig up a huge uh, volumes of soil. They'd wash it through shake it out and the tin was heavier and they'd catch the tin and then take that to process. Now, what what year are we at at this point? Is this the well, Chinese no, I mean, coming We're in? jumping all around, okay, but we're talking about um, four or 5,000 years BC. It became a center of trade in Phuket because of the tin. So when the Indians, they were the first to start civilizing here. Um, the, India had more people. They had a lot of people. And so they used to come over to the, remember that the, the, the I was going to call this book The Island in the Winds because six months of the year, the wind goes that way and six months it goes this way. Yeah. So it's pretty simple if you're a sailor. You you leave Madras or the East Coast, it's 10 days sail away, and you put your sail up and you end up and you hit the coast here. So here they had, um, they didn't have clothes. They didn't have textiles. So these guys would bring, um, you know, shirt, just clothing uh, because they were using tree bark and or na- they were naked. Uh, but what they did have here was tin, which they need to make, you know, ship's cannons. You can't have a, a, a copper cannon or a steel cannon because it's going to get rusty. Yeah. And, you know, you st- stuff the explosives in, it's going to blow up on you. Cause, so you need, you know, gunmetal or bronze um, for, for weaponry. Um, they wanted elephants, and there were loads of elephants here. Elephants were needed in wars. So they would come over and trade ivory. They would trade elephants. Um pick up like jungle produce like the kingfisher feathers which are used until very recently that every milliner in london and paris needed these beautiful purple mm. kingfisher feathers so they got jungle products and they would bring mainly textiles over who were they trading with well just trading with the local village people like so uh, they uh, knew that you yeah. know once a year these indians would come over and and now we're referring so the the boat people they're, well, they're no, they, they were settling by then. The, okay, okay, let's go back. The Malays came up here yeah. and met the boat people who are known as the Salang people in those days. Um, and they, Ujang, Ujang is um, a promontory in Malay. So they called this place the promontory because it wasn't an island then. There wasn't, um, it's later that the, where the bridge is, um, the water broke through. At Where the bridge? Yeah, right. so... Uh, so that I mean, was as late as 1846, you could still walk a- across in an a- on an elephant, right? Okay. So it was a promontory um, of the, the Malays called it the, the Ujang Salang, right? Which comes to Junk Salon, right? Ah, okay. So, um, and then they called the, the um, hilly bit. So you get Talang comes from Salang, right? Yeah. All the, the Talang people, they're still called the Salang people in Burma, further up, the boat people. So they called it the promontory of the boat people, but the Malays were more advanced, civilized. They they did agriculture, they did wet rice, they did dry rice. So they moved into the flat areas like Talang and all that, and they called the hilly areas Bukit. Bukit is a hill in you know Bukit Tinggi in Malaysia. Oh, okay. So Bukit is a hill in Malay. So this was hilly island because it is very mountainous, and so it was known as uh, Bukit later and. Later, when the Chinese came and this place really civilized, I'm talking like 17th, 18th century, they all moved into the Bukit area, the hilly area, Katu, to get the tin there. So they started Bukit Town or Phuket Town, and it, it became a province of Phuket. Um, but before it was always Talang or Ujang Salang, right? or the French used to call it Yan Salang. Mm-hmm. So that was the old Malay name. So the Malays were here. The Indians came over to settle with them and trade with them as they did all the way down the peninsula, you know, um, down through Kedah. And there were these big trading centers started. At the same time, the Chinese were wanting to deal. Remember, uh, the Romans made contact with the Chinese, but most of it was seaborne trade. Yeah. So at that time, the, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the peninsula of Malaysia and Sumatra just blocked the way. I mean, the only way through were the Straits of Malacca. And below that, you don't get the monsoon winds. It's called mm-hmm. the land below the winds. So you wouldn't, they wouldn't sail down to Australia. No one went there. They could just go due east. But 
through the Straits of Malacca, there were so many pirates. Yes. They would just set upon any boats. And also their sail technology wasn't good until about the 5th or 6th century that they could and maneuver th- And through. this is where we're referring to Malacca being it's the, it's the, it's the city south of uh, Kuala Lumpur, right? Uh, well, it's on the coast. Yeah, yeah. On the coast. It, it was the main city on the coast for, yeah. for some years. Uh, that, that goes into the 14th century. Yeah. So what these guys would just go due east, hit the beach, and then the Chinese, meanwhile, and the Vietnamese and the Indonesians with their spices, there was demand for spices. Um, and all the spices come from Indonesia. You know, nutmeg and yep. uh, all of them come from Indonesia. Um, so they would sail this way because they wanted textiles. So the Indians would come with their textiles. They trade with the locals here. And then, you know, it's only like 45 kilometers across the peninsula in some places. Yeah. And so the elephant had trails. So they would go on little carts across or they'd use the rivers. And so you had manual carrying of the goods from one side of the peninsula to the other. And there would be a trademark on the other side. Right? So the Chinese are coming from the east. They were coming the on Indians the wind are that coming way. from the west. And then they're just crossing. I yeah, think, they were yeah. meeting on that side. And yeah. then they're meeting this side. So the local lords could cream a lot of money off this, right? Uh. So that's when you started getting the growth of the first kingdoms here. So there were a lot of localized little kingdoms. And this is, you're saying, about 17th century. No, 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 no. This is uh, about the 4th and 5th century. Okay. We're well, still way back, right? Yeah, yeah. So then um, you actually got the rise of kingdoms here. And they became, they were all uh, Hindu kingdoms because the Indians brought their religion east. So let's say they came as a, you know, five ships came in a flotilla to trade. They would bring their um, smart guy with them, their, their um, usually a Hindu uh, teacher like the priest of, yeah the priest yeah. so the local villagers who were animistic in those days you know believed in trees and whatever you know termite mounds were extremely unlucky if ever they came you had to move the whole town and so they were very animistic tribal people almost paganism at this point and then yeah i mean they they believe you know it was Bef- Malay before, stuff. before before the before there's any structured yes, religion gotcha so these guys would come so the chief would make make hay by being friendly with the indian that Indian leader, and and so he would change to his religion because then the guy would trade with him more and he could make money trading to all the other people around, mm. you know, then boats would go up up the rivers and collect yeah, ivory and give them you know, textiles or whatever. So these centers of trade developed. And then because you actually had to store stuff here, I and mean, if you notice, there's not like in Europe, there's not a lot of walled cities in Thailand. You don't get many walled cities. Maybe Chiang Mai. That's about yeah, it. anything like uh, Kampan, uh, mm. Kampan Pet, Kampan means walled city. There were only, you know, whereas in, in Europe, every town was a wall, or Italy, everyone was a walled city. Mm. Because in Europe, you had to store your goods for the winter. Where here, you can eat all around. If, if anyone, if you came to invade me, or you were pirates coming, I just run into the jungle. I can grow my fish, I can eat my durian, I can just wait till you go away and then go back to my village. And I was reading something on that, that this is also... Possibly one of the reasons why Thailand was never like conquered by the British because they could just run away. Is, is that yeah, true? Well, well, it was conquered by the British, but I mean, it was, I mean, it, absolutely it was, yeah. but That's, uh, well, generally, we were, yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't want, to, the lords did not want to lose their people. So they didn't want to go in a fight with another group because all you're doing up is kill your people. Your land's no use without people, right? Yeah. So you couldn't have any food or stuff to trade. You couldn't send the guys in to kill tigers and sell tiger skins or, and trade with these guys unless you had people. So why on earth would you go and have a battle where this lord kills those lords' people? So they didn't, they had these fights, but they'd all gather up and do their jingoism and bang their, you know, show their bums to each other. L- literally, they used to moon each other and threaten and flags and bring their elephants. Very tribal. As, as the early Europeans said, you know, there, there was a lot of show, but not much fighting, right? And so then, the, you know, an eagle would fly and that would be a bad omen. So, okay, you win. Or so it wasn't until you got the, the Turkish coming and the, the Portuguese and where they actually killed people that they took over this area so quickly, the Europeans, because they, and, you know, and they the Dutch, killed people. The Dutch as well. The Dutch came after the Portuguese. Yeah. So, okay, so you've got these Indianized kingdoms for about 2,000 years. So we know from the rocks and the big carvings in the museum that these are carved in local stone. So... You know, there was a, a Hinduized culture here for now we're going from about 2000 BC until 1000 AD nearly. Um, 
So the Indians ruled. It was all run by Indians, Maharajas. Uh, Thais all have Indian names. Um, they're, now, they're, were they looking Indian? Like this is well, you look the... at your average Thai. He's Indian. Okay, so you know they're, they're a little bit, but you, the, the 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 Thai people interbred with the Malays. The Malays were more Chinese. So they're, but they so were Indians. So it was, it's kind of like Indian, Chinese, Malay, and this is yeah, kind of the, the Mongoloids make yeah. a bit because the Thais came down from China. Yeah. Well, they came in about the 12th century. Um, there were no Thais at all. And it was just Indians and Malays. And of course, they interbreed. This island has always been free sex, right? Mm. And it, it makes no difference whether you screw a black person or a, a Chinese or as it is today. It's just everyone has sex with everyone. No one cares right it hasn't changed. it's pretty liberal muslims can yeah. you know shag israelis and you know it doesn't matter here it never matter so it's always been a real blend of east and west on this island and because of the monsoon winds that's why i wanted to call it an island in the winds so, wow. and it's the same today you've got all these half half chinese ties right when the chinese came it was usually single men coming on the so they would just shag with the local girls and they'd breed and then you'd have interbred families, and a lot of the Indians are going, well, I'll just live here. You know, you've got everything here. I've got girls, I get massages, I get, you know, why am I going to go back to India and I have to fight in wars and, you know, stress? Uh, you can get all your food here, you get everything, it, and you don't need clothes. Would it be a completely different story and even podcast if you were to bring in the aspect of the Khmer, the the Siam, and the, and the Hmong tribes? Um, and how that kind of... Did that funnel also into into Phuket as well? Because I'm sure, like, yeah, the, the, the history of Thailand, that's another podcast as well. That's but another I'm, podcast. Well, yeah. they, they all link in. But the first real um, eastern Hindu kingdom was the kingdom of Davarati, which is roughly where the where um, Kanchanaburi is. Kanch oh, yeah. So, then so up that yeah. area, they actually became walled cities there. And, you know, education, um, they had scholars and monks and and they were all buddhist and, and from there Burry's buddhism a, spread all the way into china and japan the, and the everywhere. river kwai so everyone yeah the, up bridge, that way, the up bridge that over way, yeah. Yeah, i mean this, a whole area yes but they also at one point controlled phuket because it was a good source of income um anyway you know let's let's fast forward to increasingly the the chinese empire the chin people expanding Qing dynasty um, oh, there's a million dynasties over time. Yeah. And they pushed all the Mongoloid people below them, like the Khmers, like the Burmese. Like, they pushed them south. So they came and displaced. So the, the first Thai starting appeared in northern Thailand in about um, the 12th century. And, and they took over this town called Sukhothai, right? Which was um, the first big Thai kingdom. And from Sukhothai, they, they were very militarized people, the Thais. They were horseback fighters. They knew nothing about, they'd never been good sailors. Um, so they started taking over. And in those days, you, you had what was called a mandala. If you were strong, all the other lords paid homage to you. What, right? Sorry, I'm not familiar with this term. What does that mean? Well, a mandala is, um, it's like a kingdom, but it was a kingdom without boundaries. So, you know, if I'm stronger than you, you become my underling. You become, so I give you the right to run live there and I'll protect you, but you bring me women, you bring me product and you come and pay homage to me and, and then I leave you alone. I don't come and kill you. Mm -hmm. And more oh, I'll protect you. And now you're in my mandala now. So it's like a kingdom, but it's not like in Europe where they kind of drew boundaries. So you could have a guy over there who'd go homage to you because he didn't like the other Lord and you would have to fight that other Lord. So, yeah. so when I went to battle, I would call on you. I'd say, right, Brendan, I want you to bring 50 guys and two boats and, you know, rice with your people to fight this other lord. So then I'd control that lord. And that's why the the Burmese made a big kingdom. The, the Siamese made a big kingdom. Yes. And around the um, Nakhonsi Tamarat, which is on the other side of the peninsula. Um, like Nakhonsi Tamarat. Now it's known for gangsters, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. But that was a holy city because um, some Malaysian, some Buddhists had set up there and said, you know, there was some relics of Buddha said to have been found there. And it became a, it was a big trade center, but it became a religious, um, it became the main center of the whole peninsula. 
This is the peninsula coming down to Malaysia on the east coast. This is Nakhon Yeah, well, the, the whole peninsula was yeah. run by Nakhon Si Tamarat, okay. uh, the, the strong lord there. Yeah. And eventually, either through intermarriage or a battle, the Thais took over Nakhon Si Tamarat. And they had 12 stellar states. Uh, they called it the, the constellation of 12 states. And Phuket was one of those. So he wanted to control the trade in Phuket. He also controlled the, the, controlled the trade on the east coast and he controlled all the forts and rivers in between so he controlled this this really prosperous trade now are these people are they still chinese descent or have they've no, kind they, of they, they, these are sort of ties with malays okay. and, and indians yeah. um you know naked or they they you know a lot they would the women would be same hairstyle as the men uh, they used to black their teeth out because they thought white teeth was like a pig or an animal so when the first Europeans come, they thought, oh, man, you've got white teeth. How old? Whereas they had horrible, and they'll chew beetle nuts, so they yeah. had ghastly mouths. A lot of the Europeans wrote about it. I mean, Thai women were not seen as beautiful, right? The um, the Davarati women were, were really like, because they they had white teeth. Um, but, you know, sailors arrive and they're horny, and then, you know, you so yeah. there was all this interbreeding. All, you know, Indonesians were shagging on that side, and, and Chinese were shagging on that side, and... Malays was shagging on this side and Indians was, and it's just all interbred. But the lords were the lords. And, mm -hmm. and remember, because there was no people, women were very powerful here. They still are today. Women run everything here. They more businesses are run in Thailand by women than any other country. Divorce is easy here, right? Um, even for the Muslims, they can get a divorce. They can't, um, because you needed women to breed more people. You, mm -hmm. They needed people. They needed people all the time. So if a woman was like not getting what she wanted, she'd get in a boat and paddle up the river to the next village and breed there. And so they would give the, all the rights to a woman. So if, um, you know, if a man went off sailing and didn't come back for a year or something, she had the right to up and move in with whoever he wanted. And he came back, she's gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was no like in India, you know, you submit, you'd beat them to death, right? Because in India, they didn't need people. It's much so, more orthodox. Yeah, you know. or, or in Europe, you know, where there was enough people. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was more people than land. Women are much less valuable. So in comparison, even in Malaysia, which is the same, you know, a fairly strict Muslim country, divorce is easy. Women still run a lot of business there. You know, we've had women prime ministers. We have all the women. The mayor of Phuket was a woman. You know, the women yeah. are very strong here. And as you found out, no doubt, women control... They, they move in with you. They take over, right? Uh oh, well, I'm headed to Bangkok in about an hour. So <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna see what happens. There. <laughs> well, you know, but you know, <laughs> I would say move in. Women are very strong, powerful. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, um, she doesn't watch this this podcast. Don't tell her. That. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we, you, you were starting off on the, the first kingdom was his Sukhum Thai. Well, and, that was a kingdom in the north. This in the is north. the Thais arriving here now, and yeah. we're now at about the 14th century, and the Thais established a kingdom, or not the Thai, the Siamese. It was Siam. It wasn't. It was Malays. It was Indians. Can you what, can you explain Turkish? Define what is Siamese? I understand it in, in terms of like geography and, and watching different okay. uh, videos. But okay. explaining the difference. If you go to Malaysia between, today, or or can you explain the difference between like the Burmese, the Siamese, and the Khmer and the Hmong? Like how 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 do they differentiate in terms of their descents and what distinguishes them from each other? Well, I mean, I could say not much, but mm. you don't tell them that. I but mean, it's, it's just, over time, they've developed their own cultures. But they all basically came from just uh, from the, um, from uh, what's the so southern China area? The, can the Canton area. Uh, well, no, more in the mountains. So as oh. China moved south, oh, the Burmese Kun, went there. Kunming? It's yeah, like Kunming was yeah. the first big Thai kingdom. Yeah. But they got moved, they moved, and it was called, I forget, it was a very strong Thai kingdom. The Thais, I believe uh, it's T apostrophe A-I, which means the free people in Chinese. So they always lived just outside the boundaries of the Chinese lords. Mm -hmm. And they were quite powerful and they were very militaristic. And so when they spread, they were all Thai people at first. But then they formed, like Burmese was slightly different. They came from north from Tibet, right? Okay. But roughly the same story, getting pushed south by the Chin, the Chin people. And, but the only kingdom that ever united all the Thai people, because the, the Laotians are all Thai, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the Vietnamese were different. They came down from China on that side of the mountains, the Annamites. So the, um, 
but the only king that ever was King Bodhuaya when he invaded Thailand, took it, and he invaded Laos. The only time all the Thai peoples of the world have been in one kingdom was under the Burmese. Thais will not tell you that, but that, that's the case. Um, so Siam, I'm, I'm actually thinking, why is it called Siam? Siam was a, the Thais have a saying, um, the Chinese do anyway, there's a Thai food where you have all the different dishes. Mm. And then you have, what do you call it when you have your mush, your rice breakfast? Oh, congee. Yeah, so you, well, congee, but the Thai word for it. I have no idea. So, so <laughs> essentially, Siam was all the flavors of the world. Like if you go to Malaysia now, you see Indians, mm. you see Chinese, you see um, Iranians, you see, uh, you see Europeans. Everyone's free to live how they want, right? And Malays, right? And Malays, yeah. So they all live different. They all have their culture. When Thailand became Thailand, which was a dictator following Hitler in, in 1939, he followed Ataturk. He abolished all other cultures. So, and it became Thai, the land of the Thais. So they got rid of all the parts of Siam that were not Thai, which means he gave away Cambodia. Well, they had it nicked off them by the French and the British. They gave away parts of Burma. They gave away the Malay states. Before that, the king of... The king in Ayutthaya, and then later the king in Bangkok, was a very powerful king. He owned the whole <laughs> basin. So he would control, they say, as far as Singapore. There he would run into the, the Indonesian kings. The, um, you know, they would conflict yeah. there. The Burmese, he would control as far as Burma, and they had a, a few horrendous wars for about 300 years. And then he would fight with the Vietnamese. Right? So that was the range of Siam. And he would go up as far as the mountains to Kunming when the Chinese were strong. And that was the range of the Thais. So and that those are just from the war, the borders expanding and retracting. Yeah, just, you know, I'll go, I'll go campaigning this season. Yeah. I'll take over all these lords, submit them to me, and, you know, take my... So Th Thailand, it stretched all the way through Malaysia right down to Singapore? Like, they controlled oh, yeah, this land? We're talking Siam. Si uh, Siam, okay. Um, and so there was all these different people working in Siam, like the governors, the, the Iranians were, were very smart. So they would, Indians, they were running the, um, the government, right? So although the king himself was Thai or maybe Chinese, or he may be Malay, right? But it was the kingdom of Siam, but it was generally Thai, to Thai predominantly Thai. The Thais were the best fighters. Um, so what you get is when he, made everyone speak Thai. You can't speak Chinese, Chinese. you can't dress Chinese, you can't, um, all the Indians had to become Thai. Stripping the Chinese all the have culture. all taken on these enormous long Thai names, right? Yeah. Instead of like Chin, right? Mm. They, they've now, Chin Awatras, you know, and they go on and on, which is usually a royal name or a name to make themselves proud. And everyone has to speak Thai. Um, and so they became, Thailand is a very um, generic place now. Everyone had to salute the Thai flag, and they became the land of the Thais. Would you say they've united them, or was it kind of forced? I was fought. Well, the Phuket people never wanted to be in Thailand, right, before. They, they fought against them. Um, but, no, it's, it's united them. I mean, it, you know, the rise of nation states. It became mm -hmm. a nation state, whereas before they were just kingdoms. Can we speak on that? I mean, I'm sure there's some things we have to be careful of, but, like, is, is that... Was that a good thing or a bad thing? In, I mean, in it's retrospect, it's subjective, like everything yeah, yeah. in history. I mean, I I would prefer to see it like Malaysia, uh, where you know mm. I like to go and you go into the Indian part of town, or you go to the Chinese area, or you. I like that difference, but then you know it is what it is, and and I like Thai stuff too. So. Well, we're starting. To, uh, we do see that in Phuket. It's evident in like Phuket town. It feels very Chinese there. Yeah. Okay. That that's a different story. I'll come on to that. Okay. Oh, we're running. To, how are we doing on time? Oh, are we? Hans, you're the time. 45? Oh, we got another 45. Okay, oh, so okay, so we're now at a state where you've got a, a strong Siamese king controlling all these little kingdoms. Do you want some water? Or is... No, no, I'm good. Okay. Um, and, you know, south of there, the, the Malay states were pretty independent. Like the king of Kedah, he would often join with the king of Burma to fight um, the king of Siam. So the king of Siam, when he got powerful enough, would tell his overlord in Nakhon, go and, you know, just demolish the Keda. And they were brutal by then. They were getting brutal. You know, they were just horrendous who, atrocities. Who is Keda? Is it representing a... a Keda is a state, a northern state in Malay. So the Malay okay. has lots of kings and lots yeah. of independent. 
they were previously under the king of Siam, but when the British showed up, uh, they they sort of allowed them to be independent um, and said to the Siamese, this is our sphere of influence. Or when the Dutch showed up, they did the same. So then you get around 1400, you get the Portuguese coming east. Um, sorry, 1511, they first came. Um, and they basically had cannons and guns, and, and but they mainly turned into mercenaries. They're coming for trade. Primarily. They were coming for trade, but they set up a trade fort in Phuket. Um, yeah. Prior to that, that was run by the Indians were running it. There were Indian governors here under the king. There was a big revolution of the local Malays against the these two Indian brothers um, who ran this place pretty corruptly. I mean, the corruption was terrible here. I mean, it was just as if you were a lord, you could do whatever you wanted to the people. So, I mean, whatever you wanted. And it was, um, what would they call it? Um, um, like if anyone spoke out and you got... No, words. no, no, there's a word of... Like, it was like a dictatorship tempered by assassination. If you were too bad, they'd kill you. Like treat any type of treason, like in this sense? Oh, yeah, or, anything. You yeah. get... I mean, they had horrendous... Even the even the Europeans coming out here, just... The, the, there's a whole section in there of the sort of tortures they had. Of those detailed stories. Oh, yeah, just um, horrendous tortures. You know, like they'd, they'd make a, a big bowl, a bronze bowl, and close it, put you in naked. And, you know, elevate it and start a fire under it, a small fire. So you'd slowly, not only would you cook, but you'd be sizzling away. And then put the fire out and leave you two days and relight it. And, you know, until you died over three weeks or and or they'd bring you out and, you know, make you eat the cooked bits of your flesh. And uh, just horrendous, you know, yeah. put, your, put their hands. Just savages. Put, put their hands in molten tin and, you know, just uh, all sorts of things. Even the, even the Europeans who were more savage said they're ahead of us on torturing you know they know tortures and but the they were much more gentle people here but not the kings and the lords they were vicious so mm. anyway so then the, the portuguese showed up trading and they wanted to dominate everything um so they tried to control phuket the dutch came and took over from the portuguese as the strongest power um and then Ultimately, the British came and took over from the Dutch. Was there, were there wars between the Portuguese and the Dutch and yeah. the British of a transfer of yeah, power? Yeah, big, big fighting around here in Phuket as well. Uh, on land, on sea? Um, mainly on sea. Um, so the locals, would, there's some accounts of locals who would gather, like in Patani, which was another kingdom, which used to fight against uh, Bangkok. Where, when where the Burmese is, where, where is Patani located? Patani is uh, Patan, uh, the kingdom of Patani. Patana, it's it's where the um where all the trouble is in the south of Thailand. Oh, like Hat Yai, this area. Yeah, south from there. Gotcha. That that's the kingdom of Patani. Okay. Um, which which was another Malay state, but it got stuffed into um Thailand, and they never wanted to be in. In like nineteen fifteen, and they've been rebelling since. Um, and Phuket also didn't want to be in Thailand. Um, trying to be kind of its own. Well, they just wanted to run their own affairs here. They still do. Yeah. I mean, in those days, um, you know, the king in Bangkok would steal most of the money for the, well, I say, take most of the money for the tin. So yeah. they produced most of the money for Thailand. Even today that goes on was, you know, Phuket gets, because it's got a small population, official 395,000, you know, it's over a million with people here every day. Yeah. But registered people here is 390,000. But you don't meet many Phuket people. They're mainly from Isan or mainly from around. Yeah. They come here to work because it's a booming economy. Mostly if they're in Phuket town. Yeah, yeah, so you get all the hotel taxes. You get all the money from tourism. And it all goes up to Bangkok. And uh, they don't yeah. send. That's why the roads are so rubbish here. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to Udon Thani or Isan, where most of the population is, the roads are amazing. You know, they're wide and because they're getting the votes from there. They didn't care about here. There's not enough votes. So, mm. so there was all that... That's been going on for a long time in, um, you know, that abuse by, by Ayutthaya. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the king would take 20% of all tin. He would take 20% of the smelting. And, and also he would do tax farming, which would be say like, right, Brendan, you're the tax farmer here. You've got to bring me X amount a year. You could collect X, Y, Z, W off the people and blow it all yourself and, you know, have sex with the people who don't pay and their daughters become your slavery. Everyone was a slave of the king, actually. So um, 
And as long as you paid X to the king, he let you be, right? So that was tax farming. And and, and what year are we at now? Chrono, chrono, well, no, no, this is this is well. The whole nothing really changed here between the 14th century till about the middle of the 18th century. Okay. I mean, all they did was gather together to fight against Europeans, and piracy was terrible here. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there anything on the island, like maybe in Phuket Town, that's extremely historic or? Um, that that stands out for you, whether that's been built by the Dutch, Portuguese, the British, or even ancient <coughs> Chinese. That you you know probably a hidden gem on the island that people wouldn't be aware of what it represents. I no not really because um, until Prior Rashida started building these old houses or Phuket Town formed, which copied Penang, right? And kind of Malacca, I find as well. Yeah, well, right? well, it was, you know, they call it Sino Portuguese. It's actually Sino Hampshire. Um, because when they first settled Singapore, Sin Sino Ham what is Hampshire that? Hampshire, as in England, because okay. um, what's his name, Raffles, mm -hmm. who ran Singapore, was from Hampshire. Gotcha. And he set out that all shop houses, you know, you, the Chinese can move in, you get a five meter frontage, you were taxed on your frontage, right? Yeah. And you had to put a walking street with a bit of cover. I wish, like the French had, you know, you, he made them plant trees too, their town would be a lot cooler. Um, and that's why these shop houses are long. They go way back, right? Because you only got tax on how wide your shop was. And so the Chinese used their Chinese roofing tiles. Kind of right? even like this condo. It's like a shop house. Yeah, well, it was built as yeah. shop houses. That's a tradition. Uh, you know, you, they're five meters wide. And if you can make them longer, that's better. But you, most people wanted their shop frontage. And that's what they paid tax on. So when the British settled Penang in 1786... All the Chinese came to settle there because the British bought, brought um, stability. Because otherwise, if you were Chinese, let's say you wanted to go to Mine Tin and you were on well, anywhere, right? If you were here in Surin Beach and you set up a tin mine, um, the pirates would soon hear about it. And the Malays were all pirates. Um, they lived on their boats. They fought. They were great seamen. They would get five or six boats together, come around here, capture you if you didn't run away enslave you sell you somewhere further down the coast as a slave and they, they wouldn't do the tin mining it was too much work right so what they're so, just going to get slaves yeah they collected people and oh, just because they know that, okay i got it yeah. and they might catch a tin as well that you'd mined the last three weeks and then shipped yeah. off and so if you tried to go on a boat and move your tin they'd intercept the boat so all commerce was being smashed by piracy here so there was not really much commerce other than done by some Indians, and the Europeans came, the pirates didn't go after them because they had cannons with grape shot and stuff. So when the Europeans came, there was more commerce going on. And they were doing a lot of, they were basically selling guns and selling mercenaries and selling guns so that these kings, kings, but the king of Burma could have cannons to fight the king of Siam who wanted cannons and he'd want Portuguese mercenaries because, or, or, you know, a lot of Turkish mercenaries. Uh, were coming out because uh, they would be they would actually go and kill people and it was they were good fighters generally mm -hmm. and then the dutch came and they were ruthless right i mean they said we want to control all trade so there was a lot of there was a big battle in patong where they wiped out the dutch and it was quite ungovernable for for most of the europeans here because the local people are very tough here how long did that take for stability to arrive here well it really only arrived when the british got steamships, which was the 1830s. Prior to that, they took Penang. And remember, the, the funny thing about Phuket, you say it wasn't, a, the whole of the Bay of Bengal was a British lake. You started Sri Lanka all the way up through India, Burma, all the way down Burma, all the way through Malaysia to Singapore. The only bit that isn't, that wasn't British was Phuket Island and down to Renong, right? Why is that? That's another podcast, but okay. look, but basically, I mean, like, they, yeah, they, basically, when they first came to capture Phuket, um, they the American War of Independence started, right? And so they they pulled them back. They were loading the troops on board. They said, "No, we're going to war with France, and that forget chasing Phuket. We need to fight the French." Um, on several occasions, up until the end of the Second World War, the British were going to take Phuket. But the Americans stopped them. They said, um, no, 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 enough. We've flown it. Because uh, then the Americans took over this country after the Second World War. 
Yeah. I mean, sort of political. Briefly, though. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, till the 60s, 70s. This is know, when they, they, they're they landing they in control. Pattaya. And, yeah, they, yeah. Um, because the American, the British were exhausted after the first war and they'd, they'd been humiliated in Asia by the Japanese. So, mm. so they, um, they couldn't control it. Like, but before, okay, so let's go to the 1830s. Okay. Because th then things started changing. Everything was the same until then. About the 1830s, 1840s, the British came with steamships. Now, prior to that, these big, long-masted British gunships could not chase down the pirate ships because they were long boats with oars, right, and uh, flatter and fast boats. And they would see these long-masted British ships coming from a mile off, and they would take off into the islands, and these ships can't follow in amongst all the islands. They'd, they'd live on, you know, you had the... The boat people, the the Malay fishing people lived. Yeah, and, so they were safe. And that right? would be on uh, that would be on the west coast as they're coming. Oh, well, anywhere on oh, those islands all down the west coast. The Andam uh, the, are you talking Andaman Islands or getting like closer, like Samilian and? Yeah, well, similar. There's islands all down this coast, right? Yeah. So and all the riverine bays and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. so they couldn't control the the piracy, but once they got steamships, and often you know often it's becalmed out there, and at which point. The Malay pirates could come with 60 ships and attack a, um, a foreign ship. They could take them because they would come up behind under the um, rudder, jam their rudder when it's becalmed in the mornings. You know, you're not moving and you can't get your access to them with your cannons. And then they just come on board and, and take, you know, a trading ship. Let's say it's got 20 people on it, right? Of which three would be foreigners and the rest would be Indian trained sailors. The Malays would just take everyone as pirates, take everything. So, um, but they tended not to attack European ships because they usually use the, the cannons. So as soon as the British Navy got four or five steamships here, they just went and trashed all the pirates' um, bases. They went in with sepoys, Indian sepoys. Um, there's a great story off the end of Koh Lanta where the first time this guy, he had smoke coming out and no mast. So the... Pirates saw him off Lanta. Lanta was a big pirate base, Koh Lanta. And they brought a flotilla of like five or six log boats with 40 people on them, a significant force, and saying, look, there's a foreign ship. It's in trouble. It's on fire. And um, they didn't figure out that it was going against the wind, right? Uh. So as they came up, he just goes, oh, here they come. He just turns broadside and just blows them out the water, right? And They don't so, realize it's actually the steam of, of the yeah, ship. Yeah, I mean, or? it was coal-fired, yeah. you know. Yeah, because they've, um, they've never seen it. Before. They've never seen it, right? Yeah. And then they bring these metal gunships. So suddenly piracy disappeared. Now you can do commerce. Now the Chinese from Penang, where they were trading and doing tin mining, they started moving up here to Phuket. So so just to step, step it back, I didn't fully understand that part. The steamships from the British, is it because of the technology? Is it the speed? Specifically, why, why was it the steamships that allowed them to kick out the pirates? Because they couldn't, they couldn't um, catch them in the big British gunships. Got gotcha. you. And if they went in a smaller ship, they'd be overwhelmed. So, you know, if if like if you were being chased and you were in a a skiff, right, and let's say a boat of forty meters, they would have a thatch hut on the back. They probably had some slaves down there. They had rowing slaves, sometimes two rows of oars. They had their sail. They could out outrun a British ship. Um, and then they go, let's say, cut in behind the, um, under the bridge. The, and then they get into Pangna Bay. And how are you going to find them, right? You can't. So they could just get away. Then they'd go and raid Pangna Town and steal all the slaves. and go. So the British couldn't stop them with, they could, when they did encounter them, they beat them. But with a steamship, you catch them up, it goes faster, you blow them out of the water. Yeah. And then you go that, take that steamship to, the nest of the pirates or, or wherever the, the Malays were saying, and you just kill them all, right? Yeah. And they say, if you want to do piracy, as the one naval boss here, he said, we've got to make every pirate feel like he's sitting on a barrel of gunpowder with a lighted match, yeah. right? And so when the piracy went away, suddenly people could come up here and, and trade, you know? And so the Chinese started coming up here and saying, right, we'll do tin mining. So they... They, the only way into the middle up to Katu was up the Klong Bang Yai, it's called, which is the Klong that starts in Sapanhin 
and goes mm -hmm. all the way through Phuket town and goes up into the golf courses there in um it, it crosses by the um Just, hospital you yeah, know the, um, it crosses by Tesco and goes all the way up to Katu that was the main highway into the island so in order to trade Phuket town started as a port there where Sapan Hin was, right? Mm -hmm. It's Stone Bridge. There was a bridge across the river there. Sapan Hin means that. So um, a town form. So that the Chinese would get dropped off there. They'd pay their one, they'd pay their one bat or whatever tax, and they'd head off and go tin mining, right? Um, and then other Chinese appeared to, you know, cook food for the other guys. And others came to sell picks and shovels, and others came to set up whorehouses. And others came, and so it became infested with Chinese. So that by 1870, there was approximately 200,000 Chinese here and about 3,000 Thais. Mm -hmm. So it became a Chinese-run island, right? Um, and there was, it was still Siam. So there was no difference between... And the king at this time, he was okay with the that? King, yeah, he was as long his... as the Lord was paying him gotcha. his tin. He doesn't give the it. Lord would collect tin. He loved to have these Chinese coming. They wanted more people. And the Chinese were happy. They were exporting people like hell, right? Mm. So they needed people to mine the tin. So they were happy. They gave all the power to the Chinese. And, and then he would make his tax lord a Chinaman, right? He would make the, the governor who's doing the real work a Chinese guy. But he said, look, if you step out of line, you know, the, the Thai army is going to come here and kill you all. Why couldn't they, uh, why couldn't Thailand provide their own people for the tin mining? They just didn't have enough? They didn't have enough people and okay. they weren't, they, they're agriculturalists. Okay. You know, they, they, I don't say they're, they're like the Bumi Putras, like the Malays, that they, fundamentally, no business was run here, but only Chinese do business. Thai men never touch money, right? They would go and grow their uh, durian or whatever, but previously all Thai men were slaves. So if, for example, there's even stories where if a durian tree was growing in your garden, you would just go and cut it down because... Next thing you know, the retainers of the Lord would come and say, that durian tree belongs to the king. Mm -hmm. And if any of the fruit fall on the ground, you're going to be liable. And if you can't pay it, we'll take your wife. They'd rather just not do any work. Um, so it was their wives who were in the market trade. It was, it was seen as demeaning to deal with money in Thai culture for men. That's why women do all the market trading. Um, now it's changed a bit. but um, So... Yeah, they so, were not. So the, Ch the Chinese are here at this point. This is 1870. 1870s when Phuket Town started forming. Yes. So the capital of was was Talang before that, right? And that's up by here with the Tesco and the Talang Hospital. Yeah. Oh, and it was also Bang Rong, and it depends when the Burmese came. And that's another whole story when the Burmese took this island and and just you know denuded it of all people. And the Burmese took this island on several occasions. So, so when you hear about the Heron sisters. That was the one occasion they didn't take the whole island. The Heron, right? Heron's Monument. Yeah, the Heron's Monument. They, the, the French had built a fort here, 400 meters by 400 meters. Where was that located? No one can tell me, uh, but it, I know roughly. I think it's where the Wat in Bandon is, but that's just my opinion. The Wat in Bandon. Ah, okay. You know, I know that square. Yeah, I yeah. think it was there. There's the, the school across the street, right? Yeah, in I the, think yeah. it was there, but then other people say it was over here. You know, they've got a historic... Nothing exists of, of it. Anyway. Well, I mean, it is because Scottish guys were coming up from Benang and writing about it was in Bandon, but it was called the Fort of Talang. And we know, for example, that um, during the sieges of the fort, here's another one. They took these British <clears throat> cannons, the Brazilian... Uh, the Burmese took British cannons up near the Talang waterfall on a, on a hill there and were firing down into the fort. Well, they're not going to do that if the fort was... There's a lot of discrepancy, and no one here can tell me. None of the village chiefs, none of the old people. Yeah, you know, because that this was only three to the waterfall ago. is quite... That's a distance. I mean, 3,000 people died there, right? Mm. And, and it would be a fascinating dig to do because... Um, you know, it, it's very soft. It would have been in the rice lands there. And it would. And they built a moat around it, right? So um, it would be a fascinating dig. You could make a whole museum. You could make a whole new place for Do tourism. you think to dig at that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. If that's just my feeling of the what. But even if you go to the antiquities department, you know, they have no idea. If you go to the museum boss, the history mm. museum, they have no idea. If you go, then no one can tell you. 
so, and it was only a few generations ago. It's like, how could you have forgotten? What, what t when when was that approximately? Well, the last uh, the Aaron sisters was um, was 1786, right? Okay, so this is before the Chinese in the 18. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I well, mean, while it was still, uh, I think that would be an interesting thing. We'll clip it later. Could you tell the story, like uh, more oh, about I've done? I've written some newspaper stories on it, but, uh, but because you know, everyone knows, really, they don't monument. really like um, a foreigner doing their history. They, they don't like it because they have their story they want to tell. And you know, I at one point I was warned off. There are things I couldn't put in the book. I'm sure um, because they like you want to live here, you can't. You know, same as you can't possibly talk about the king. If you want to live here, you can. If you want to go and live in Calgary or something, and and right, you can, but don't come back here, right? Yeah. And so, in fact, there's things about the Heron's sister, the Tautep Kasatri, I couldn't write because they said. Can, can we explain? Like, um, because everyone knows Heron's monument, but no one, I don't think anyone really knows the story. What's the backstory behind all that, or what can you share? Well, no, the backstory is pretty simple. She was, um, according to my research, you know, all historians can argue over stuff but there's really good documentation about it because um there was a british captain living here called francis light um, who, who settled penang eventually for the east india company and he lived in phuket before and um he was a real shag around guy so he he was he had all these girlfriends here and they all wrote him letters all the time when he's penang asking him for money the same as today they, if you read these letters from they're the same as you know you see the hookers writing to the <laughs> their husband's letter you know yeah. there's books published they're the same really yeah. oh my mother's sick you know my water buffalo's died please send rose water <laughs> yeah. and money that's same right we need to build a wall for my uh pigs or yeah, yeah exactly so but he kept we're gonna get in trouble notes don't worry this is all in good taste guys <laughs> yeah no, no I mean, it's just facts of life it's it's all good but um he kept a lot of notes and he made contracts with them um basically they said look if you want to take this island We'll fight against the king. Um, and um, so, uh, who who said that? Uh, well, this is where it gets dishy to say. But there was a there was a there was a guy called Priya Pimon who was the governor at the time. He was the Thai governor. Um, um, what's her name? Uh, the Heron's Moni Tautep Kasatri. She was from a Malay family in Kedah, right? And my own feeling was she was a bit of a little gold digger, right? So she was pretty good looking. And she first, her family moved up here and they were quite strong Malay family in Telang. And in those days, when the governor came, he would defer to his, he married her. Um, he would defer to the wife's family and the wife would run the affairs. It was the same that the governor would like drink and go, you know, go and cockfight and stuff, right? And do his politicking. She ran the island, her family ran the island. Um, but prior to that, she was up in um, Pratchup Kirikan, where she first married her first governor. And then she divorced him. He was an old guy, so she married into money there. And then she came back to Phuket High so enough to marry the governor here, which was a very prosperous, because in you know, all the gun trade, all the war trade, this was the furthest west port of, of Siam, right? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to sell guns to the king, like Francis Light was a gun runner, you could come from India to here and sell the guns. Because by then the Burmese had taken all of Tenasserim province, right? Um, so this had a lot of commerce going on, a lot of the tin trading, all the, so it was a prosperous uh, governorship. You could steal a lot of money if you were the governor here. Uh, still can, right? So <laughs> he married her anyway, then the Burmese came to attack the island in one of the other invasions of Thailand. And he died just a few days before the Burmese arrived. So she was left, everyone looked to her as for leadership, because she was the de facto leader of the local people. He wasn't even from here, the Paya Pimon. Um, and by then, normally what they did when the Burmese come was they all just ran away to Bang Na, right? And you just go in Pang Na, you, the Burmese couldn't chase you. Just keep going inland, inland till they give up. You wait till they steal everything and you come back and your houses are made of straw. You just rebuild your house, right? And you can get, you know, you take your cattle or not even cattle, just your goats and chickens with you. And you bring them back and life goes on and you plant some more fruit and off you go, right? That's why they didn't have forts. Because if they had a fort, they'd have to go and take it back from the people. Mm -hmm. 
and there was nothing to protect, right? Only, only the tin that had been mined was the only thing of any value here, and the people, right? So they just wanted to come and steal the people because the people, you go and sell them somewhere else. People were the most valuable thing here all the way through. And so slavery and piracy was massive here. Right? And this, so the Burmese were doing this consistently. The Burmese would come and raid them, steal everyone, yeah. steal everything. And so, hey, the Thais did it back to the Burmese. I mean, there's no, they're bad and we're good. And now it's kind of back to today with all the Burmese working here. Yeah, yeah. the, the, the periods through history were, you know, Thailand's doing better than Burma right now yeah. because they've got a screwed up government. But other times when the government, the king here was screwed up and the king there was good, they yeah, were strong. Ebbs and flows. It's yeah, yeah, since 1500. Right? So it's specifically on this case, this was a time when the Burmese attempted to come in. So the Burmese, no, they came, they attacked and they surrounded the island. And so she said, look, we'll go to the French fort because we there had been a big shipment of cannon come in just prior to that, um, that were, they were waiting for the, to be picked up by the king. And they had a lot of gunpowder and they had a lot of grape shot, all waiting to go to the king. So they went into this fort and they held the Burmese off um, for almost a month until eventually the Thai king defeated the main Burmese army and they left, right? And she was accredited with saving the island, right? But there's a lot of horror stories after because the Burmese burnt all the crops and everything. So once they'd left, everyone starved, right? Mm -hmm. There was no food. I mean, you could go and get some fish, but that was about it. Um, and the disease broke out, but she did defend the island against the Burmese and became famous. So the king asked for her sister to come up to be his concubine. Um, and that's at uh, Sao Sisunthorn, which is the road going this way. You've got Tepkasatri Road yep. and Sisunthorn are the two sisters meeting at the Herons Monument. Um, uh, and she, and that's she why bred that with the That's king. why that area is called Sisunthorn. Well. Yeah, she, her yeah. name was three, this whole uh, road right through to Kamala. What is this road's name? That's the Sri thing. Well, you live in Thailand. You don't know any road. No, no, this is Sri Sunthorn Road that goes to oh, Kamala I all the know. way to the Herons Monument and all the way up to Back Lock. Yeah, right? gotcha. And yeah. it crosses Tepkasatri, which goes from Phuket Town to the bridge. Right? And that was their names. Yeah, that was the two sisters' names. There we go. Because That's a reel right there. Let's clip that. Right. <laughs> so, um, uh, God, I go on and on, right? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, I, I'm jumping all over, but uh, no, that, I I, th I think that just because to cover everything is going to be hard, but I think that story in particular, anyone on the island or in Thailand, especially in Phuket, they'll be able to. Everyone knows what the the monument is, yeah. so it's a and but no yeah, one so knows she, what it means. She became famous for that, and then she um, she, I think she was later having an affair with Francis Light as well, and he was having an affair with her daughter. Because she wanted to hang out with the British. I might have missed that. Who who was Francis Light? Francis Light was a guy who he's a guy from Edinburgh, actually, or um who came out here with the he was a a, a naval officer in the in the Seven Years' War. When the Seven Years' War went down, he was a midshipman and Britain took all of India from the French in the Seven Years' War. And he moved out here to Madras, right here, Madras which is a short sail across that way. And he um, ran a, a trading company. He was employed as a ship's captain for a trading company. Mm -hmm. And that company would go and collect tin and everything and take it back to India and trade it. The British were running the trade around there, whoever was the strongest army. So then later he left the company and he set up, it was mainly they were selling armaments to the king. And he set up, he borrowed some money and got his own shipload of armaments. And he eventually moved to live here. And he based here in, in Tarua, Tarua, which means harbor. Because a lot of foreigners were living there, a lot, a lot 25 were living there at that time. And he lived here for 20 years and he got land. And so he was the one who wrote to the East India Company saying, look, you need a base on the east side of the Bay of Bengal, right? Before that, they only had India. And we need a base near the Straits of Malacca, which was controlled then by the Dutch still. And um, Phuket's a great island. And these people here will fight with us against the king and will take it. And once the British got the island, because their navy was so strong, the Thais couldn't get it, right? I mean, they couldn't get here. They'd just blow them out of the water getting here. And so he said, you know, we can grow coffee. We can." They wanted to grow marijuana. It's all in the contract. 
but I couldn't show that contract, which, um, which I believe was signed by Tautep Kasatri or by her husband. So mm. I was warned, you can't sh say that. You can't have the heroine showing that she was going to fight against the king. So mm. I thought about it. I said, well, that's the main thing in the story. And then I thought, well, no, it wouldn't have been her. It would have been a governor. So I phoned the, the woman who really helps me. She works at the university here. I won't give her name, but I said, look, yeah. if, um, if, um, if I say it was Paya Pimon made this contract with the East India Company to fight against, she says, yeah, that's fine. No one knows Paya Pimon. So uh, that was her husband, the one who died. Yeah. So um, she asked for support from the British as well. Um, but laterally, what happened was the king of Kedah, who also wanted British support against the Siamese king, he offered them Penang for free. So they settled in Penang. At the same time, they were going to take Penang and Phuket, right? And that was another reason when they couldn't go because the Burmese invaded. And there was a rule in the East India Company that said, that forbid them because the British government had got involved with the East India Company because they were absolute fucking pirates, right? But the government wanted to control them and make them more. That was, remember, up until about 17th century, European colonialism was swashbuckling, just go and raid and steal. Yeah. After about the 1780s, you got this idea of, um, of we'll colonize them, we'll, we'll educate them, you know, white man's burden. And so the British government wanted to be more responsible in the way they settled and take colonies. And they realized in India that you could make far more money taxing farmers than going and stealing, you know, raiding a town and stealing it, which was what the British did as well at first. So they wanted to set up all these colonies and do trade. And so they said, look, you cannot East India Company, you cannot just go in and if there's if there's a war between two locals, you can't take one side for benefit of the company. So they were not allowed to come and take it because the Burmese were occupying. And it was just after that that the American War of Independence started and they called back the troops. So mm -hmm. although they were in Penang, they could never take Phuket. That was so. What when they left? Who kind of controlled Phuket at this point? Well, then it went back to the Siamese king, yeah. who, who was pretty pissed off with it, and he came in and killed most of the people here. He had them all buried up to their necks and trampled with elephants. Okay. You know the leaders. So um, that was a common way of for tyranny, uh, for um, yeah, tyrannies. You you were buried and or, or just killed by the elephants. Elephants were executioners here too, because or, or you got your head chopped off. But the best more. A better spectacle was an elephant killing you. Um, so you'd be tied up and the elephant would stomp on you. And these are elephants trained to execute people. Wow. Um, anyway, so I know it's yeah, brutal it's, stuff goes on here. Anyway, the so. The torture is just insane. Oh, no, they, they had some, amazing, you know, just wicked ones uh, they were doing. I, I won't even go into it all here. That, look, on this, that's why a podcast would be good. I've got 36 chapters in there. Yeah, I think. And it'd every be single chapter we could make do this an hour's book. podcast on. It's yeah. very hard to. Go, you know, you jump, ask a question. I well, we, we, it's uh, kind of like an audio book where you're just going to read it and then people can go listen to the yeah. whole thing. Well, um, but so there is so much to say here. There's so much details. Um, it's hard to do it in an yeah. house podcast. Yeah. How are we in time? We're at one out. All right. No. Two o'clock. I have uh, one ten. You're flying to Bangkok, aren't you? I got a flight at four. We're still. Oh, no, well, look, look, we can wind it up. So I'll just, actually. I'll come into we're the. At, we're at one twenty. One twenty. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, let's. Well, we. Look, can... I'll wind it down from there. So, so what happened is eighteen thirty. I think we got yeah. up to. <clears throat> well, no, no, no. Now Phuket Town formed, and and then um, the British basically said to the Siamese king, um, "Look, you let us trade with you." Because the East India Company didn't want to take over a country because they were a private company. So if they, like in Burma, right, if they have to go in and put in troops and put in magistrates. And, and this is the East Indian Company. I've, I've read, a, and I won't touch on it too long to let you get back, but this is, these are famous from the books Taipan by James Claval. And well, really the East India about... Company was given a, a royal uh, to settle all yeah. lands in Asia. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and it was a for-profit company. So, for example, in India, when they controlled India, the East India Company controlled yeah. the originally, er, eventually the government took over the East India Company, but it was still a private run company, mainly run by Scottish people. Um, but when they, um, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, they, um, 
They didn't want to take over Siam. They could have done it in literally an afternoon. They could have sent their gunships up the Chao Phraya River and said to the um, the king, you know, we'll blow you away if you don't, you know, submit. Like the same as they did in Burma. I think it took them 10 days to take Burma. And he was even further up the Irrawaddy. So they could have taken it at any point. But they said, no, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll protect you from all the other foreign powers. <clears throat> now, you know, the French wanted, they were coming east from Vietnam. The Germans now were beginning to form up and wanted a colony because they'd missed out on Germany only formed in like 1870. They wanted to take Thailand. It was the richest non-taken colony. And the British said, we will protect you, but you've got to buy all your guns from us, all your armaments from us. You do let us do all your banking. We want to take care of all your sugar and rice trade. We'll run on our ships. Um, and then we won't take you over. So it was a client state of Britain. At the same time, they said, you better free up your rules, like get rid of slavery so that there are people to work for British citizens who wanted to come and start mines here or, or you know, felling trees. They had the right to fell all the hardwood trees. So these Chinese people who were British citizens from Penang came up and started opening all these mines mm -hmm. with British protection and with Thai protection because if the Thais screwed with them, they knew the British would just come up and take the island, right? I mean, they could take this in a day, right? Yeah. So, and because the British were killing the pirates, it became a real center of prosperity. I mean, and because Penang became a real place next door where the latest fashions from London were and, um, you know, cinema houses were opening and all. And there was a steamship running from, from um, Phuket to Penang uh, daily, right? Um, so you could take the overnight berths and it was much easier for Phuket people to go to Singapore or Malacca. So they all started putting their kids in British schools, you know, so they could into, they could do, I mean, if you made money on a tin mine here, you did not want to keep your money here because there wasn't any banks, right? There were no banks until Siam Commercial Bank started, but the Standard Chartered Bank moved in here, I think in about 1890. So there were, you could, otherwise, you know, you keep the money or your gold or whatever you kept. You, well, there was no money here before until the tin mining started and the British started bringing currency in. Everyone bartered before that. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, they had Penang next door. So all the rich Chinese ties, they had their big houses in Penang. They'd have their dinner parties in Penang. They'd, you know, go with the hoity-toity with the Brits and they'd speak English and they were sort of protected. So the king of Siam started putting in intelligent Chinese governors who could control the thousands of Chinese coolies, you know, because by then the Hokkians had formed their triad and mm -hmm. they would have, there were huge triad fights going on on the island where you'd have 14,000 people. At this point, we're getting close to the- We're getting 1890s now, 1890s, 1900s. Yeah. Phuket town, then this guy came in called Priya Rashida, right? Priya Rashida was, um, was a Chinese guy um, who was a Hokkien, and most of the Chinese here were Hokkien. And he got the lordship of, he started off up near Ranong. All his father's family came from Ranong and took over all the provinces here. But Priya Rashida was a really good governor. He started making courthouses, building prisons, putting in roads. He introduced rubber trees. And he developed Phuket Town. So all the old government buildings you see there yep. were all developed by him in 1912, 1904, 19, right? And he really made this a prosperous center. Was so there th much like, um, I don't know, not real estate development, but actually like old buildings from the 1600s, 1700s that we can No, there's still none of them left. What the, 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 the first real buildings come about the 1890s. What do you, what, there's none of them left as in they were destroyed or they just never existed? Um, they didn't really exist, or they made made it from wood and didn't Something, last. Something, yeah. So the first real, the oldest building is in Taru, you know, the old Chinese courthouses there, which was again a Thai built. Um, which area is that? It, it's Taru is when you get to the Herons Monument and you go right to Phuket Town. Yeah. Yeah. On the left, there's that new Chinese temple by the road. Yeah. And just behind it, you'll see all some ruins. Okay. That's the oldest existing building in Phuket. I think most people know that it's on the way to Central. And then, yeah, that yeah. huge, there's a massive parking lot there to that temple. And it's pretty much. Yeah, but behind that, it's very, it's quite an interesting to walk around there. Interesting. That, you know, it was the old Chinese courthouse and it was 
But eventually the coolies went up and took it over one time. Um, and he chased him out because he said he was taxing them too much. And he ran away to Bang Na. And um, they had to bring a new governor down with the army. to. So basically the Chinese ran this place until, um, yeah, about 19, 1930. Um, and then what happened is in the 1920s, the army overthrew the king, the first revolution. Um, mm. Because it was pretty bad how the kings treated people. And so the military um, took took over. And um, and then, you know, there was the period where there was run by military rule and they were modernizing and Bangkok was modernizing. And then came a period when Siam or Thailand, there was a guy called Pibun Songkran came along who was a, a military strongman at the same time as you had, you know, Franco and Hitler and Mussolini and Ataturk in Turkey. So Turkey was the same as Siam in that it was a big empire, the Ottoman Empire, right? Yep. But eventually they gave away Palestine and Syria and, you know, um, Bulgaria and all. They just went to the land of the Turks. And they did all these rules and laws. So a lot of laws in Thailand are based on Turkish rule. Because previously there was a lot of connections between the Turkish and the um the Turkish were good mercenaries. The Turkish were governors here. There's still a lot of Turkish businessmen here. Um, so they formed Thailand, right? Uh, I forget the year. I think it was 1939. At exactly the same time that Japan started invading China. And the Japanese needed an ally, right? And the Japanese needed rubber. And you can't run an army without rubber. Right? And Thailand by then was beginning to fill with rubber tree. That was the new big business, tin and rubber, right? So rubber started in 1905. And by 1915, everyone needed rubber for industrialization. Um, and by then you couldn't run a Navy, nor, you know, you needed rubber to run a tank, a car, anything, guns, rubber was, um, and the Japanese needed rubber for their war machine. And all the other rubber producing countries were Vietnam run by the French. Indonesia run by the Dutch, uh, Malay run by Britain. The only place they could, so they really butted up the the, the dictator here, um, Pibun Songkran. Is that where you get the 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 Chi the Thai New Year Songkran? Does it come from this guy? No, no, I don't know. Okay. Uh, his full name was Pibun Songkran. Okay. I a Thai would tell you what Songkran means. Yeah. Yeah. They took these names. Yeah. And so, um, meanwhile, everyone knew that. You know, Japan was going to invade South, right? And, you know, whether the Philippines or... Come. So the Europeans, the British, needed Thailand to protect Malaysia and Singapore. Singapore was the jewel in the British crown because it controlled all trade from east to west. You had to go around Singapore. Yeah. And so that was the, the jewel in their crown. And to protect it, they'd slowly taken the Malay states off Siam. You know, they took Burma off Siam. The French came east and took Cambodia and Laos off yep. Siam. And, you know, even China came down. So the poor kings of Thailand slowly had to give away. And the French and the British at one point said, the French wanted to just say, look, draw a line down the Mekong River. We'll take that bit. Britain, you can take that bit. You can tie Burma up with, with Malaysia. You, you know, that can all be British. You can have the whole place and we'll take that and we'll own Indochina. And the British said, no, 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 we don't want to be next to um, the French because they did have a fight in a place called Mong Sing where some Gurkhas were guarding the British at the top end of the um, Mekong where Burma joins Laos. Yep. They had a fight and they like killed... The, not, not the Golden Triangle, no? Yeah, ju just up there, yeah. yeah. I mean, a bit north of there. And um, the French were expanding east and the British guards stopped them at Burma and they killed this quite... Um, handsome famous uh colonel grosjean was killed by a nepalese a gurkha shot him and the two countries nearly went to war in 1909 over thailand uh, over over that incident but they had to say look we've got germany breathing down our throats and yeah. first, so we can't be fighting so the british said right we will not we will use thailand as a buffer zone so if you notice all around the british empire in india None of those places have been colonized. Iran was never colonized. Afghanistan was never colonized. Tibet was never colonized until now. And, and nor was um, Thailand. 
So that they wanted India protected by a buffer zone from the Russians and from the French, mm. right? So that's the reason. That's the only reason those countries weren't colonized because the British said we want a buffer zone. You go in there, we'll attack you. Kind of similar to what the Russians are doing with Ukraine. They want their buffer zone. Yeah, yeah, roughly the same thing. Yeah. Um, so they, um, yeah. So they. That, that's the reason Thailand had its shape today. Uh, the British. <laughs> that's great. They had a meeting in the. Uh, in the in Paris, and the British minister and the French minister decided they were going to draw the boundaries of Thailand. They didn't even invite the Thai ambassador, you know. So they and the French had all these different plans how they would divvy up parts of it, and the British said, "No, we want the whole country as a buffer zone." Mm. And later they sent that to the Thai ambassador, in in who covered both London and France. It was a European, one European. And he thought that was a splendid idea that, you know, keep the whole of Thailand as a buffer zone. And so Thailand formed its shape. And so Thailand never got properly colonized, like the government kicked out the king, you know, like everywhere else. And so they say they weren't colonized, but they were certainly a client state of Britain. And then later, the French, the Germans came in in the 1890s, and they started saying, they were a bigger, stronger industrial power, but they only started later in the world. You know, they only formed in 1870. By 1890, 1900, 1910, they came to um, They took all of King Ch Chulalongkorn's kids, who previously would go to Oxford and Sandhurst, mm -hmm. started bringing them to Germany to educate in Germany. They started building all the railways for free in Thailand. So all the railways were built by the Germans. And they took over all their shipping, They and the British didn't like it. Is that um, maybe why the current kings are connected to Germany as well? When yeah, yeah, around? yeah, yeah. There's a long, strong connection yeah, there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Russians tried to take Phuket at one point because in the... Well, I think they have in a different way. Well, in, a, <laughs> <laughs> in the Japanese war, when the Japanese beat the Russians in 1905, yeah. the Russians had no way to get their fleet from the Baltic around to the Pacific without a coaling station they could rely on. And the only place not really taken by the British or the French or the Portuguese on that route was Phuket. So they came and then they started buttering up the king. So the Tsar came to visit and you've seen these pictures of the king and the Tsar and, and the, the Russian, the, the Thai children were sent to Moscow. Um, and he said, look, you've got to give me Phuket as a coaling station. And the British said, no, no, a coaling station means a naval base. No, you do that, we'll invade you, simple. Same with the Germans. Um, the Germans asked for Phuket, and the British said, no, you do that, we're taking you over, simple. So they managed to keep all the other powers out of Thailand. Mm. And, it, and and look, all credit to the Thais, they were very good diplomats. They were like, um, for example, the King of Burma said to the, 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 the governor, the British governor sent over from India, you've got to take your shoes off to come in the palace. And the, 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 the governor said, I'm, I don't take my shoes off for a native king, right? Um, so he said, well, um, I won't see you then. So he goes, right, I'll take over your country. Whereas, you know, King Mongkot or the other, they, they were, you know, well-spoken. They gave presents to, it was actually the ambassador of, um, from Hong Kong who came down here to open up Thailand to commerce, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of being a slave-driven feudal state, he said, you've either opened this up, the same as the guy, the black ships in Admiral Perry did in Japan. You've opened this to commerce or we're taking you over. Simple, right? Um, but he would like give gifts to the sun and take him and look through his telescope. And so they were, the, the, th the Thais have been very good diplomats, but they've also been quite two-faced and they've managed to play people off each other. So now we're at the Second World War. They butted up to the Japanese and they're buttering up to the Americans and the, because both, it's a very strategic position in East Southeast Asia. And then the Japanese eventually invaded. The Thais fought them for a day. And and then Pibun Songkran said, no, we're going to join with the Japanese. And is this kind of where these stories from in Kanchanaburi with the River Kwai start to come together? Yeah, no, because then the Japanese occupied and they went through here to get to Burma. They went through to get to uh, Malaysia, yeah. Indonesia. And then the then uh, Pibun Songkran said, well, I'll better go with the Japanese because... yeah." They could crush me if I don't. Um, and that was a good decision in a way in that the, there wasn't all these massacres like the Sukching massacres in Malaysia where the Japanese killed all the Chinese. Or in, or in China. Yeah, and China. They, but they, so the Thais worked with them. 
but the Japanese abused the hell out of them. And there was a lot of resistance here working with the, the British. Anyway, the British eventually came back, took it over. And that's when they said, look, we're joining the Japanese as war reparations, we want good get, right? Mm. Um, and the Americans said, no, you won't have it because they wanted the power. And then the Americans took over. Then you get to the era of Vietnam War, right? Uh, and, then, and then you're getting the Americans. They're coming to settle in Pattaya. Yeah, then they're coming to Pattaya. Yeah. It becomes known as a place where you, a man, a single man can come and have fun. Yeah. And then they're going, well, there's this little island called... So we're talking 60s, 70s. There was almost no one here. Yeah. And then you start getting Patong Beach opening up. How did they decide to make that transition from Pattaya to Patong Beach or Phuket? Well, no, it's just like tourists now. You, then you go to Krabi. Backpackers, start, you know... The, the route between Australia and Afghanistan and Europe, people started backpacking in the 60s, 70s. Yeah. So they were passing overland. So they would hear about, oh, you could get magic mushrooms in Koh Samoy. Yeah. And that you know, people would gather there and then you get little shops and that's all Phuket is now, right? Yeah. Um, it's more than that now. It's going beyond that now. So that's where you get Patong starting. And then people go, why would you go to Patong? I'll come to Surin Beach. So And then you got people like me show up going, well, I'm going to live here. You know, why am I just going to visit in a hotel? So they actually had to ban tin mining. Um, they made a decision in 1989 to put a 25% tax on all tin mining because before there were dredgers working out here when Laguna mm -hmm. opened. And it's not really good, you know, a nice, beautiful beach with all these dredgers. Yeah. If you go scuba diving out, you still dive on the old dredgers. And then it became a tourism center. And then it became, you know, you had that like one night in Bangkok, that song came out and tourism just exploded Explo here. From that song, you think? Well, no, that helped, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's my year. I was like, well, I'm going to go to Bangkok, right? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, uh, you know, that's why people came here. Well, was, I got to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're so good. Too, too, so, you know, it, it was led minutes. by sex tourism. It was led by... You know, they're very strong culture here. Beautiful country, beautiful people, beautiful food, beautiful beaches. Mm. What's, what's not to like? And then you got the Thai, what was it? The, the Tourism Authority of Thailand. Mm. They started some really good campaigns in the 1990s about, um, you know, Land of Smiles and all of that. And then you got the combination where you got the Thai Airways International, where previously you could book to Bangkok but you couldn't book down here on Thai domestic. They merged. So you could book in Germany, you could book all the way through to Phuket. So before you'd have to land in Bangkok and take, you know, five days on the train. So people weren't coming down here. There was, there was no roads even at that point. Yeah, well, you could road, but it was a two day drive. Um, then the roads opened up, but, but people could fly in. Then they made the new airport, then they made the bridge. And now we've got 13 million tourists a year up before COVID. And now people are, we've got the, Hospitals, shopping centers, the, one of the fast, fourth fastest internet in the world, uh, fantastic restaurants, you know, great medical, great dental, sports for everything. You want to play rugby, you want to go. Um, in sailing, interesting you wanna, people. You've got all sorts of colorful well, I people. Think I, and it's uh, one of the best places in the world to I live. I think uh, before we, we wrap it up, because we're at that, that, that part, Aj, uh, well, and we'll talk about this in a second of, of these crypto meetings, you can come check out as well. But do you remember what you said at the crypto meeting to define the um, um, the people in Phuket where 80% of them are... Do you, can, do you, do you recall yourself? Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, I really like the way you worded that, if you don't mind. Well, my, my thing is, let's say there's 50,000 expats here. Uh, you know, 45,000 of them are really interesting people. So, you know, who you run into... Uh, they're the sort of people. Sorry, got, Hans, the, the map. <laughs> no, uh, they, they sort of get up and go um, <laughs> to come out here and to live here, and they're sort of laid back to be here. Whereas if you go to, you know, Hans, where are you from? Which town? In, Pretoria. Sorry? Pretoria. 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 In, um, in South Africa. Oh, you're yes. South Africa. I thought you were yes, German. Yes. Okay, so. No, no. Okay, you go to, if you go to, if you go to, you know, München, or you go to Calgary, or, you know, Wherever, a small town or in you go to Canada. Scotland, or. 95% of the people you meet are boring. You know, if, I mean, Australia, most normal places, most people are pretty standard boring. And, you know, 15, 20% will be, uh, you might meet 50 interesting people in a town of half a million, right? And you don't communicate so quickly like you do here. Whereas here, you come here, you meet this guy, everyone's sociable. They're all doing amazing stuff. You know, most people who have come here are generally independently pretty wealthy. Uh, they've got businesses all over. 
they're sailing here, they're doing this, that. And so for a very small community, it's, you know, you won't find more interesting people in London. I mean, I just met you the other night. Look, you've set up this studio. You're doing all this. You're doing you. I mean, you've been here six years. I've never seen you. You know what I mean? You've never met me. I've yeah. been, and we probably have. We've been drinking, but there's so we've many. We've probably met five times. We don't remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But but the um, the beauty of COVID for me was I always saw these expats. Oh they're, oh, they're all they're all tourists. And then you realize the tourists have gone, and there's still a lot of expats here. You know, Russian girls. You thought, well, what a Russian girl. You find out there's all these Russian girls working in hotels or running little businesses and or you find um just a lot of people I met who'd been living here right near where I live for years. You don't meet them. It's a real leave me alone culture here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think before when there were the tourists that we were kind of these expats were diluted in the population. Yeah, that it, yeah. it was a bit difficult to tell the difference. Yeah. You physically had to ask, are you, you living here or not? Yeah. But during But the, you presumed the, at first they were tourists. For sure. But, and then but now during, you find out that everyone's living here. During the lockdown, you knew everyone was most likely yeah. an expat, yeah. right? So it was easier to get along. And, and you know, it's it's hard when you go out. You don't want to meet tourists because they're going to ask you 95 questions yeah, that yeah. you don't want to answer. Sometimes I swear I just want to print a piece of paper and <laughs> fucking hand it over. Good luck. Yeah. It's yeah. an injection. But no, this is kind of why I started this podcast as well during the current situation was more or less, I recognize that. that it, it's... it's um. Let's say we were there were mining tin. Now I'm mining interesting people. Yeah. Or, or the other way to do it, to think of it, which I wrote, I actually wrote that is they were agriculturalists here. So they were doing the rubber trees and they were, you know, mining, uh, doing their agriculture. But now most of it's been built out, right? But these people basically um, cultivate these um, um, villas now. So when the villa gets built, they can move in. You've got the pool service. You've got the management company. You've got the real estate office. You've got the tax person who makes the Thai company. And you keep cropping these money out of these things every year, yeah, people. which is a lot better than rubber trees, right? Mm. So more and more as it's filling up, they're still basically farming. Because um, once you bought the villa, you may love it, but and you may sell it. But it carries on having to be paid for, you know. The yeah, and I think goes, and, and Thailand's evolving. And I find Thailand just in general, they, they are quite proactive in, in thinking. And um, Oh, yeah, the government's and, and handled really we'll, well. We'll wrap that up on that point because I think this leads into maybe a quick question is like, what are your thoughts as well um, with Thailand basically like legalizing or, you know, not putting any tax on crypto. I think we're going to see an influx of a whole other, uh, you know, ecosystem or community of people coming in here. Do you see that happening? I, well, I, I see it happening already. Yeah. I mean, mainly because the speed of the internet, which, um, you know, if you look, there's only South Korea, Singapore, Luxembourg. But not for mining. It's too no, expensive. No, but I'm saying you yeah. need to have uh, internet. The, the power is not too expensive here. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, the people are moving in. If you can do it anywhere in the world, and this is one of the best places to live, they are moving in here and doing their mining. I mean, and they're doing it's old Solana, the whole Solana mob. Um, they moved over and took over the island out there. You know what was it, Coconut Island? Solana. And they were setting up. The, well, quite a few Solana guys. Um, but but they were setting up like um, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, incubator. There's incubators being set up, but here. not physically mining it, are they? Using no, no, the but yeah, they're setting not up, the you know, new new protocols, yeah, and building. Okay, and okay. There's a lot of that more on the back end side than like. Yeah, not, there's not a actually, lot of yeah, tech yeah. stuff going on here as well. Yeah. There's a lot of good medical stuff, you know, using rubber for replacements. There's a lot more goes on here than think. You know, a lot of finance industries here. Yeah. Why would you sit in Phuket? Or why would you sit in Hong Kong? Or being like me, I, I had an office in Singapore. I had an office in in Hong Kong. At great cost, two of us. We said no. We just buy a beach house and work from here. That's what. And that's, you got the plane. You can fly anywhere. You can commute. That's I, why we came in here. Yeah. I was in China and yeah. our, we were living in Shenzhen and the factories in Foshan, and we realized we were already working remotely because right. we never go to the fucking factory. <laughs> exactly. So we're like it's well, you we just were just the problem is yeah, you know China. It's pretty crazy. I was there. We were there five six years. So every weekend, weekend warrior. I probably could have done that in the first year, but we were just drinking and being yeah. stupid. And then five years later, we're like, wait a minute. what the I, We literally, one day it clicked and we left the next week. That yeah. was it. That was the end of it. We're well, just that, like, was, that was like us when the back collapsed. <laughs> like, I said to my partner in Singapore, mate, what we're paying in rent, I can buy a, a 
two row of land on the beach front yeah. or naked beach house and a nice office. You have a beach house, I'll have a beach house. We've got all our clients. And also when the clients want to come and visit you, it's much nicer. You take them on a boat trip, you go yeah. snorkeling, you go scuba diving, you go partying in the bar. And the airport's right there. The airport's and it's quick. about two hours. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's wrap it up. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to kick it back to Colin. This is his camera. You can tell everyone where they can also find the book and uh, some information maybe on the crypto meetup and anything else you want to talk about about yourself or what you're, you want to plug and whatnot. Uh, that camera. That one. Right Am I on? You're on. Yeah. There okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's the book. It's called it. Oh, it's really or just look right into the camera. Uh, See this? Oh, that one. Yeah. I'm you see it at. under the light. Okay. Yeah. Is okay. That's why I've not been looking at the yeah. camera. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a bit bright. It's called the history of Phuket and the surrounding region. Um, yeah, you can buy it. Um, mainly look, I've got a bit lazy about selling it. I wrote it a while ago. You can get it in, um, Asia books, uh, but you know, go to lady pie or go to some of the local restaurants where they sell it. Right. Um, yeah. and, um, thanks for the, interview and uh, the yeah. chat and all of that and yeah it's more just roll on phuket man it's chat. A cool I, place i'm here. gonna be running off because i got a flight to go see my girlfriend hello i don't know if she's watching this well this will be out in a couple weeks i'll be back by then um and again just to like let people know we're not trying to sell this book here I, generally it's fucking interesting and this information you can't find it online so no no there's no one uh, i'm gonna be arrogant here and i'll say i don't think there's anyone in the world who knows more about the history of phuket than yeah. me the Thais know certain things, the Chinese know certain things and ancient, but I kind of put it all together and um, it's a fascinating history. Like Greeks, we didn't even go into the yeah. Greeks and the Romans. So, you, know. you guys can leave, uh, hit us up on Instagram or on YouTube, leave some uh, comments uh, below and let us know if, there, if you'd like us to do another one about the history of Phuket or just call in in general, but I think there's a lot we could still cover on the history of Phuket. We're going to talk more about him doing an audio, an audible, an audio book as well. Um, that kind of wraps it up for today. Smash that subscribe, like all that fun stuff. And we're out. <laughs>